We have already established most of the clades that we will be beginning this project with. However, we have yet to design the planet on which this is all taking place. There are many types of stars and planets in the universe, but for this project, I would like something more Earth-like. The Sun is, imprecisely, called a yellow dwarf star, and our speculative star will be something similar. Our planet itself will be at roughly the same distance from the star as Earth. There are, of course, other planets in its star system, but we won't be going into detail about them in this episode, if ever. Now, back to our planet. For this project, I want relatively Earth-like conditions, so it will have a similar size and density to that of Earth. It also has a similar atmospheric composition, equatable to our Cambrian period. The planet will have a larger moon than Earth at, if possible, a closer orbit, along with another far smaller moon further out. These two moons will lead to brighter nights and a substantially higher tide. This time period is also marked by somewhat higher temperatures than that of modern Earth probably without major ice formation at the poles. Next, we need to decide on the land masses for this planet. Most of its land will currently make up a supercontinent, meaning a land mass made up of most or all of its planet's continents. It will be similar to Earth's Pangaea, with an equatable amount of surface area and few to no notable islands. However, this planet will have a large region of lowlands, which, due to this planet's massive tides, will effectively function as a huge intertidal zone. The constant flow of large waves through this area will result in drastic effects on the weather and geography of this continent. The tides will affect the currents, which, along with the centralized ocean and warmer temperatures, will lead to huge storms and almost constant rainfall along a continent's exterior. These storms may take the form of massive hurricanes or typhoons. Due to these storms, I'll be naming the continent Scylla Charybdis, after two Greek storm monsters that appeared in Homer's Odyssey. Photosynthesis is, as you probably already know, the process by which many Earth organisms create food using sunlight. This process usually uses the substance chlorophyll, which gives plants their green color. But does it have to be this way? Can an alien plant be different colors under Earth-like conditions? I'm not entirely sure. Our sun releases the most green light, but plants reflect more of it than blue or red wavelengths. I'm admittedly not certain why this is the case, although there are theories that it provides greater stability to the plant against fluctuations in the amount of light they receive. I've linked an older video by SciShow on this subject in the description, but if you have any thoughts or information, I'd encourage you to post it in the comments. While you're there, please consider hitting that like button and subscribing. It's free, and you can always change your mind. I hope you enjoy the rest of the video, and have a great day. As our speculative planet has a similar star to Earth, the majority of aerobics photosynthesizers will be green, using chlorophyll or a similar molecule. A little boring, but it should do the trick for now, although I may change it in the future. So far, our planet has existed for roughly 3.5 to 4 billion years, but most of this time was spent with only single-celled life forms, similar to the ancient Earth. Coinciding with the development of the Scylla Charybdis supercontinent, multicellular, animal-like life has begun to evolve, along with multicellular photosynthesizers. So far, these photosynthesizers have not majorly colonized the land, probably constricted to mats of algae-like tissue living only in coastal, wet habitats. In the ocean, however, vast plumes of phytoplankton and algae exist around the globe, fed by the nutrient-rich currents swept in by the Scylla Charybdisian tides. Alongside these algae live a clade of colony-forming bacteria that excrete layers of minerals, creating rock-like formations that resemble the stromatolites and thrombolites of Earth. All these autotrophs are food for ecosystems of filter feeders and herbivores, which in turn feed scavengers and carnivorous species. This era of increasing diversity, in which live the clades we have discussed in the previous videos, will be named the Odyssean Period, after the story in which Scylla and Charybdis feature. I'm not particularly fond of this name, so I may change it in the future. If you have any ideas for names of this period, or the planet, leave them in the comments. But for now, Odyssean it is. Thanks for watching. I hope you're excited to be getting into the evolution of our existing lifeforms in the next episode. Have a great day, and I'll see you next time.